we're the first company to really figure out a way, effectively, in a, in a way that's pragmatic in the treatment uh, realm, to generate new hair. And the way we're doing that is what we call targeted skin disruption, and that's maybe a polite way for wounding the skin. We'll go into more of what we mean by that. In effect, there was a dogma in place for a very long time that you couldn't grow new hair follicles, kind of like any other organ in adult biology. And so some exciting research led to a reversal of that. But there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, we know Eric just outlined sort of the pure tech process. You know, Falca very much followed that. It was sort of, hey, there's this interesting thing that's happening in mice with potential value, but can it translate? And so it's been a real journey for Falca that I'd love to, to kind of walk through here today, four clinical studies to get to where we are now, which is a uh, treatment that's uh, going before the FDA, lots of discussion, end of phase two meeting, we're heading into our phase three studies now um, with approval targeted in, in a few years. So that dogma actually started sort of in the 60s. You know, there were observations here and there in other mammals about hair follicle neogenesis is, is what the term has been coined, but that's adult formation of new hair. In general, it was established and, and some research promoted the view that that just couldn't happen, you know, and what was actually happening was migration, other things, it was disputed. Um, and, and so what happened at the formation of Follica was some really serendipitous accidental discovery at UPenn, followed by very careful inquiry and research to basically elucidate, no, this really is new hair follicles. What was happening was Dr. George Cozzarellas, who's the chair of dermatology at UPenn, was trying to understand which stem cells lead to cycling of the hair follicles, normal hair follicle cycling, as you know. Hairs go through uh, periods of growth and pause. Uh, hairs fall out and start again. Which stem cells do that? That's what he was interested in. And those stem cells and hair follicles are also known to be part of other processes like wound healing if your, your skin is injured the hair plays a role. And so they were actually looking at that. What, you know, which, which stem cell populations are helping heal the wounds? So they were doing wounds on the backs of mice and they saw something really neat. Uh, in, the, in the back of a big wound, a new tuft of hair. And so with a lot of careful inquiry, et cetera, they said, well, this is definitely new hair. Could this be a treatment? And that's kind of how Follica was born, was you know, it was a nature paper, et cetera, but all of it was in mice. Could this actually translate into human hair? Why is new hair important in the treatment of hair loss? Everything that's out there today, and you may be familiar with these things, Rogaine, Minoxidil, Propecia finasteride, these are marketed drugs that are actually, you know, their label is for regrowth, but they're actually better maintenance agents. They, rever they don't reverse as much as they keep you where you are. And, and yet, what they're doing to regrow hair is actually by thickening and main, you know, thickening some small population of hair that's not too far gone. It can still be rescued and, and energized. There's a real ceiling on that. So nothing, this 12% is the ceiling, and that's basically saying, look, if you have an area of, of, of hair, let's say 100 hairs per centimeter squared, you can use these drugs and get that up to 112. Some people like that effect. It's modest. And so most people who come to hair loss wanting regrowth tend to be dissatisfied with that. And so it's a good maintenance product that does limit its, its adoption and its adherence. And there are some side effects with the oral drug that people worry about. Hair transplant, very different, but it's, again, working with the existing hair follicles. How do you move the hairs around the side that tend not to be attenuated by antigenetic factors? And put the, you have to have enough of those hairs. You have to be willing to sign up for some pretty big surgical treatments. The cost starts at 15 grand, et cetera. And so for many people, it's out of reach or not of interest for, for many different reasons. So just to give you our point of arrival, what we've seen now clinically after our fourth clinical study is we can do much, much better than the drugs from an efficacy perspective that's so important. We're meaningfully turning the clock back on hair loss. It's more natural. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a much less interventional treatment. This is something like a mild sunburn for 24 hours and you're sort of back to normal. Uh, the cost can be much more modest 
And so it, it's really an exciting thing for a lot of folks. Of course, this is a huge problem. You know, 90 million people in the United States are affected. Most people, you know, are aware of male pattern hair loss. Fewer are fully aware of the extent of female pattern hair loss. It's a different pattern. It's more diffuse, uh, very stigmatic, and a big issue for many folks. For various reasons, we're focused clinically first on male pattern hair loss in terms of FDA approval, but we've done proof of concept studies in women as well, and it works there also. So that's our fast follow-on next step. And it affects men, you know, we, we heard this quality of life perspective. I mean, it's, it's uh, profound, and I was talking with Bernat, uh, who was involved in Follica before this. He got the emails when he was involved as part of the PureTech model many, many years ago. We still get them today. Can't go outside uh, because it's really affecting my hair loss. And there's a segment who are truly deeply affected. But there's a number of people who would really love to do something about it if they could, especially while the hair loss is still uh, ongoing. And so we hope to help them with that. But as I said, it was a real process. So just to, to, again, sort of take us through the key steps that led from the laboratory discovery to where we are today, the first clinical study endeavored to answer, hey, can this happen in humans at all? And so we used a disruption technique that we felt sure uh, would be tolerable, and then did careful biopsies to see if anything was happening. And we saw the shred of evidence that was really exciting hair follicle neogenesis happening in humans, and it was nowhere near enough to be clinically uh, relevant. It was, it was a very small effect. So we engaged, you know, it was a, a lot of the top academicians, researchers around the table, folks like Rox Anderson, uh, who's behind a lot of the photonics and skin disruption, so they really know all the different ways to disrupt the skin. In a way, as sort of, you know, Rox will call it as we were learning the dials that we needed to turn to optimize the effect while keeping you know, the downtime, the, the, the skin effects, the adverse events low. That was really the tightrope we were trying to walk. We couldn't do the big wound that was done in mice in humans. It had to be clinically relevant. And so we tried you know, multiple modalities. We tried lasers, which are used in other indication to disrupt the skin. Don't work, the heat's bad. Um, mechanical means are better. The depth clearly has a, uh, an impact. And so again, continued to iterate, used a mechanical approach, focused on greater depth, and then saw a lot more hair follicles and biopsy. And then in this study also looked at that hair count measure, which is really telling you, hey, is this enough hair to matter clinically? And we were seeing something 13% right around where the drugs were. Totally different mechanism of action. So it's either discouraging, we're not doing more, or, or maybe there's something really exciting. It was new hair, and that was really exciting. And some of the hair was actually too thin to matter clinically. And so this hypothesis coming out of the study was, look, if we could turn all of the hair that we were creating that was new, that's gold, into the hair that's thick enough to matter and then maintain it, it was showing need of maintenance. This actually could combine, these two mechanisms of action could be synergistic and really create something that's a multiple better than what exists today. And that, that would matter clinically. And so the, the hypothesis, again, was let's bring in one of the existing drugs. For, for various reasons, we picked minoxidil and see if the two things came together and combined. So again, up iter for the fourth study that was the one we've, we've now executed, we had a novel device to further optimize what we've learned on where the dials are, how deep to get, what's the correct density, et cetera. We tested that synergy I was just talking about with the maintenance drug. Can we thicken and maintain what we're creating? Another variable that was really important in analogous treatments was how many treatments. We were stuck on the prior uh, three studies, or we were focused, I should say, on a single treatment. You know, analog analog analogies pushed us to say, what if you tried multiple that were more tolerable? And so we tried three different regimens of treatment in the study. And we wanted to see if we could, you know, check this box, this hypothesis of three to four times growth, and, and that's what we were able to do. We saw 44% growth, as I already kind of spoiled the, the punchline on the prior slide, um, in a treatment paradigm that's very accessible, six treatments over three months, and there's competing factors for why that in between the, the six treatments over three months is sort of the optimal, and it, in short, it's because if you treat too often, you start to trample those neogenic hair follicles that are mid-development. It takes about two weeks for them to develop. 
if you don't do enough, you're not, you're not optimally stimulating the pathway. So it was really optimizing how often we did it, bringing the drug on board, and further optimizing the device, and it brought us to where we are, which is a, you know, a, a major step forward for the field. And it's something that, that jumps off the page when you look at other pictures of hair loss studies of drugs. You know, big companies have been working on this, allergens, et cetera. They're all stuck at that same 12% ceiling. Nothing's really been able to climb beyond that. These things jump off the page, and very importantly for us, because it's our, one of our endpoints with the FDA, is the patient-reported outcome measure. 100% of people saw a difference. 78% uh, saw the top two categories, moderately or greatly increased growth. That's the patients themselves rating that. And we then took those images and did more of an economic study, sort of real talk with folks. You could get, tell us how bald you are, then we show you photos of what you could get. We even said 75% you get these median photos, 25% you know, the people who responded on the more modest side in our study, and, people, you know, and, and we sh share with them the projected costs, et cetera. And people, you know, I've done this study as, also as a strategy consultant for about a decade before getting into life sciences. I've done this in lots of products. 77% exceeded my wildest dreams for this. So we were really excited to see the impact. Um, so just to pause and, and full caveat on this, I like running and I'm training for a small local marathon you guys may have heard of coming in a few weeks. Um, so it brings an analogy to me, and I know we're here at the Longevity Conference, so I wanted to sort of, you know, try to put this in some perspective as food for thought. You know, when I'm doing my training, this was my training week last week, there's a lot of debate on how often do you injure your muscles and what intensity and what do you do on easy run days, should you have them or is that junk miles? There's been a lot of debate over time, how do you get the periodicity of the training right? What's the right a magnitude of what you're doing to the body, et cetera? And, you know, it used to be sort of rules of thumb, but it turns out there's actually a lot of clinical science emerging behind this too, in a way like elucidating why it's not junk miles to do half of your miles at sort of a lower pace that's very easy for you because that's increasing capillary density, enabling you to better process energy in the cells, et cetera, et cetera. And so to me, I, this is just sort of food for thought. The analogy for me on, on what we're working with, and, and obvious, obviously I've <laughs> been running and thinking about the work and, and the training, et cetera, so forgive it. But, you know, yeah, we, we spend a lot of time figuring out how to get the right intensity to do something big biologically, which is reopening that embryonic window, but also make sure we get the you know, the magnitude of that right, the periodicity of that right, so that, that we can achieve um, uh, and maintain the effect without uh, undesirable side effects. A lot of analogies for me personally, but food for thought, is this sort of an exercise program for hair health? Uh, I'll let you all uh, think about that. So um, anyway, back to Falca and our next steps. So we have a very well-defined roadmap from the FDA. They want to see two pivotal studies. We're about to embark on that program now. We're actually fundraising for the phase three program as we speak. And uh, so we, we, we are targeting starting that late uh, this year or early next, depending on fundraising timing, and then uh, um, approval in the next couple of years. So we, as I mentioned, we've seen this work in women, so that's a very fast follow that's important for us. And then we, there really actually is a pipeline beyond that because half of the discovery was this disruption to grow hair. We also learned that Pharmacologically, there are ways to do more of that in the time period while the body's healing the wound. And so uh, novel drugs could play a role in further increasing the amount of hair that's developed while the body's healing the wound. So we're, we're excited for not only the first product out there, but what's to come after that. Hey, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. It helps get the word out. And if you love the content that I talk about, present about, please subscribe to this channel. And one more thing, don't forget, please give me your comments down below. I love seeing what you think about all of this. We put a lot of time into it with incredible people and would love to have your feedback.